Hey, what's up, everybody? Dorn Aldana here with the one and only Michael Chabot with our Art of Mortgage Marketing podcast special edition episode. And I'm really stacked and jacked to uh, have this opportunity to share Michael Chabot with you guys because uh, Michael is uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, we met many, many moons ago, uh, started out just uh, actually he was a client of mine with Client Acceleration Formula taking his business to the next level when he lived out in California. Now he's moved to God's country out in Colorado. And uh, he's had quite a, remor a remarkable journey. I'm not gonna steal his thunder, uh, but we're gonna be talking about how to find hope in the face of seemingly hopeless situations and turn pain into a positive purpose. And uh, we've all experienced pain. We've all experienced certain degrees of loss. We've all experienced trials and tribulations. Uh, many of you, of course, going through this last year in 2020 with COVID and all the crazy that's come with it, have had probably mixed experiences with it. On one side, it's been a special kind of suck with having a mask up everywhere. Perhaps uh, you've been separated from close friends, separated from seeing family. Perhaps it's the first Christmas ever that you're not able to see your family that would come from another state or from another part of town. And so there's so many restrictions and so many different areas of our life that are being squeezed out that bring joy and that are important to us as human beings, relationship, connection, just doing the things we used to do. Uh, Michael and I, we love hockey. He was talking about how hockey isn't happening right now. So there's lots of our passions that have been pulled out and that can leave a hollow place and leave pain. But there's also deeper pain. Maybe some of you have lost a loved one due to COVID or know someone who's lost a loved one. Um, some of you have been really having a hard time with COVID because you're brand spanking new to the business. You had all these you know, big dreams and goals and now boom, COVID hits and you can't meet and greet, you can't network, you can't connect like you thought you could. And now you're having to try to build a business from scratch with zero momentum in the face of COVID and all the restrictions. That's some real trials right there. And so I wanna share Michael with you because uh, not only is he, uh, you know, I count him a brother, uh, he's a dear friend, uh, he's a client, but he's also more importantly a friend. He's also a member of our Seven Figure Lender Academy. So he's a real baller, a real champion on so many different levels, a true leader. And you're going to know that to be true as we dive into this podcast. But this is really about sharing a unique part of Michael's story that I think will connect with your heart, your mind, your soul, your spirit, because it speaks to real loss in life and real darkness and real grieving. And uh, so, and also on the flip side, real hope and real purpose and real meaning on the other side of that darkness. So if you guys are feeling the pinch, the challenge, the darkness, the difficulty of the season, you have showed up to the right place, friends, because this is going to ignite you with a whole new level of perspective that chances are you didn't have before and bring purpose and hope and peace in the face of that darkness, like chances are you never had before. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to the one and only Mike Chabot. Thank you, Michael, for hanging with me today, brother. Hey, man. Thank you. I mean, that's a, that's a hell of a hell of an introduction. Uh, and, you know, while you were talking, all I was thinking is that, you know, through my journey, what I've learned is human beings are resilient. You know, we truly are resilient creatures but it's, it's a decision you make, right? We've talked about this. You have to make the decision every day, no matter what is thrown at you to get up and fight. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know where you want me to start in the story. I mean, uh, for those yeah, of you why watching. Don't we, why, don't we start, why, why don't we start um, kind of at the beginning of this, uh, this darkness that you entered in? Uh, I'll let you fill in the gaps, but why don't we just start there kind of like, how life was before, and then all of a sudden, boom, and then just kind of take us through a little bit about the uh, the, the eagle eye view of what you went through, and then we'll talk deeper about you know the shifts that happen, and and then obviously make that uh, accessible for our, our our audience. Okay, cool. So, just to give it a little pre frame, you know, I've been in the industry, a mortgage loan originator for going on eighteen years. Um, I've been blessed. You know, I came from the entertainment industry. Uh, my dad taught me a long time ago that, you know, life is about reputation, about your word, delivering on what you promise to people. And so when I got into the mortgage industry, I realized that there was a void um, at that time 
where a lot of people were viewed as used car salesmen in our industry. And I made it my mission to change that view of the industry one borrower at a time. So, mm. you know, I was very lucky. I mean, my first year in the business, I think I closed 30 million, um, you know, and, and up until what happened in my life, I was always averaging somewhere in the range of 60 to $90 million in production a year, which, you know, as we both know is, is pretty respectable in our industry. Absolutely. It's considered the top 1% of the industry. And I don't brag or boast. It's just, I'm driven to always achieve greatness, right? I just, it's mm -hmm. my makeup. And so, um, I was living what everybody I think would consider here in the United States, the American dream, right? Beautiful wife, three wonderful children, great career, able to take my family on great vacations. And, you know, we lived a nice life. We weren't super rich. We weren't one of the elites, but you know, we were doing well. We had a comfortable life. And then, um, in, uh, February of 2018, my daughter, my middle daughter, uh, contracted the flu and, uh, was getting better. And then we took her to the doctor because a few days later she said that, you know, she had told us that she felt like when she walked upstairs in our house that she couldn't catch our breath and her breath. And of course my wife and I both thought, well, that's odd, right? That's not normal. So my wife uh, took her the next day to our pediatrician. That was our pediatrician for 17 plus years. And, you know, he did all his normal checks, checked her lungs, checked her pulse, you know, her, all that stuff and said, yeah, everything seems normal. If she's not feeling better in a few days, let us know and we'll do X, Y, and Z. And so the next day, Thursday, which was February 8th, she woke up in the morning and was a little slow moving. And I said, do you want to stay home? Do you want to go to school? She's like, no, I'll go to school. I'm feeling okay. And so I took her to school and I, I signed her in because she was a little bit late to school. And I kissed her goodbye. I told her I loved her. And around 11 or 12 o'clock that day, she texted me and said that she wasn't feeling well. And so I told her to text her mother that she could come pick her up. And she did. And she came home and she told her mother, you know, Hey, I'm just going to put on my pajamas and lay in bed, you know, and she was in ninth grade at this time. So she was 14 and, um, she laid down in bed and, and, um, next time my wife went to check on her, she wasn't breathing. And, um, you know, paramedics came. I can still to this day, Dora, and I hear my son's voice cause he called me at the time he was 12 and he called me and, you know, told me what was going on. And, and my wife told me that my daughter wasn't breathing. And so anyway, I rushed to the hospital and unfortunately my daughter passed away that day. Um, you know, and obviously it's still an emotional thing. Yeah. Um, she, yeah. she passed away from something called, um, viral myocarditis. And basically what happened is when she had the flu, her immune system was weak and another virus got into her body and it attacks the heart muscle and unfortunately, it's a silent killer. There's a lot of people that die from this. Um, I've The doctor told me that during the um, H1N1 flu pandemic of, I think it was 2008 and um, here in the United States, I don't know if it was up there in Canada, but a lot of people, that's what they died from was myocarditis. Mm. We have since thankfully started a foundation in my daughter's name, trying to get better testing, better screening, better awareness on the physician's level, because, you know, that day we took her to the doctor, had they done an EKG or a chest X-ray, they would have seen what was going on. Now I've been told by other doctors at that point, most likely the only way my daughter could have survived was a heart transplant, but at least we would have had a chance. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really, I just commented, you know, I, I belong to a couple of groups of parents who've lost children. And I just commented today on somebody because they're, they put, put, put a post that said, you know, my brother-in-law says it's time to move on. Mm. And I said in my comment to them, I said, look, you never move on from the loss of a child. You can only move forward yeah. from that moment forward because everything from the past, it's completely different. And I trying to explain it to people like, Losing a child is the equivalent of dropping a nuclear bomb on your life. That's really what it is. I can only imagine. I can only imagine, mm -hmm. brother. Yeah. You I know, mean, I, uh, I remember when it happened and I remember feeling the remorse. I mean, at that point I knew you, you were a client of mine and we were in each other's respective worlds. And I just remember being so, I mean, I'm not, I'm not even Gabrielle's daddy. And I remember, having tears of remorse for her, for you, for the family. And, um, 
I mean, I've got an 11 year old son and a 13 year old daughter in that age. I've got two others that are smaller, but I'm thinking about your son and your daughter, Mm -hmm. very similar ages. And man, I can't even imagine the nuclear bomb of remorse and grieving uh, that would come from that being in your shoes. But I remember just being so heart connected to your plight in that moment having a moment of prayer for you and your family and uh and sharing the news with my mom with my wife and my kids and squeezing them a little tighter that day and even that week and uh yeah i mean it was day upon day week upon week month upon month you living under this cloud of grieving for good reason i remember seeing your your facebook uh shares just really being transparent and vulnerable sharing your heartache and your loss and uh, surrounding you with my empathy and compassion, seeing those posts. I didn't always comment on them, but I, I saw them, I felt them, and I was very much uh, compassionate and connected in empathy to your plight. Each post you sent, I just, I, I felt it and I saw your journey. And so tell us about that journey because it wasn't just a, you know, one week, one month, one quarter, and then, you know, moving on. It was like, you know, you really, you really had uh, a real season of grieving. Tell us about that season. And then also tell us about the turning point for you where you felt like you could, in in your own words, move forward because there was a season where it wasn't the time to move forward. It was the time to grieve. Tell us about both of those seasons and the turning point for you. Yeah. And you know, that was, that was hard for me, Doran, because of the way I'm wired, you know, Um, I've always just been a guy that, was extremely driven, extremely hardworking. And like, I remember a week after my daughter passed away, I was said to my wife, like, well, we got to get the kids back to school. My oldest daughter was a senior in high school. I'm like, we got to get them back. And I sent my son back to school and her, the counselor called me and she goes, he cannot be here. He's in shock. He just, and she, she helped me tremendously. Cause she goes, look, school right now is just not that important. Yeah. And that took a lot of pressure off for me. Um, I just want to go back real quick. So the day my daughter passed away, you know, I remember we were at the hospital in the ER and and the doctor came in and told us that she passed. And then they said, you know, would you like to come back and see her? And I thought, there's no way I can go back there. I can't, right? I can't see my child like that. And then I said, it's like God tapped me on the shoulder and said, like, you will regret it for the rest of your life if you don't do this. And so w- the reason I bring this up is because I want everybody to to hear this is that when I went and spent time with my daughter and saw her, I promised her that I would honor her with the rest of my life. Mm. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, for two months, right, I was the strength for my family. My wife couldn't get out of bed for weeks. Her friends came and helped her shower And, you know, I mean, she literally, I was really scared for, for a bit of time for her. Mm. And, um, but you know, she's a strong woman and she pushed through it. And as you know, I probably didn't work for about nine months, you know, now I was blessed. I had a good team and even, you know, my daughter passed away February 8th, 2018. That year, I didn't work for nine months and I still funded $38 million. I don't know how I did it. I don't know. Like, So it was really weird because around month three or four, it hit me like a tidal wave, right? Because I had to put together the funeral services. I had, you know, I had to be the rock for my family. And yeah. I didn't, I wasn't complaining about it. Like I wanted to. I was like, Hey, this is God built me for this. He did. God built me for this. And now I understand why. And so I had to be the rock for my family. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I thought to myself, man, I spent so much of my life working, but I I, want to take a pause there and say, now that I have time to reflect, I'm so grateful because I was, I was able to take my family every year for a two-week vacation in the summer. We went to Hawaii. We went to Cape Cod. We went to Mexico. We went on all these wonderful vacations. I was able to take them every year between Christmas and New Year skiing to Colorado or Utah, right? So I look at it and say, you know what? We built so many memories. And I look back on that and I'm so thankful for those times, Yeah. right? 
Yeah. And anybody who's in the industry like I am or some type of service industry where you don't have to work nine to five. I went to every one of my daughter's dance recitals. She was played tennis. I went to her tennis matches and her face would just light up when I showed up. Right. And so those are the things that are important, but let's get back to, so I was in a very deep, dark place. I never thought about suicide. People have asked me that. No, the pain is so deep that, yeah, there are days when you're like, I just don't want to feel this pain anymore. But then I also knew like, hey, my family is depending on me. Like they need right. me to show them the way. And I will share this with everybody here listening is that Dorn is the one who sparked this whole thing for me. And I told you, I did an episode on my solo cast called Be the Spark because you and I had a conversation and it went something like this. You were like, Hey brother, I've been watching, you know, all your stuff. I've been seeing what's going on. And I just want, you to know, like I care about you. I love you brother. And like, you have more to do in this life. And at first I was like, yeah, Doran, you know, and this is what I thought in my head was you just don't understand. Like you just don't know, but it resonated with me and it kept talking to me. And there was also a day where we were at a hockey tournament in Utah. It was it, the thing I didn't share is my daughter passed away one week before her 15th birthday. And so the next, that year, the next year we were at a hockey tournament in Utah and we were there for her birthday. And that night I had a dream with her in it. My son was at the rink in my dream and nobody could find him. And all of a sudden a car comes up my street and my son's in the back seat and he gets out and I'm like, who drove you? And I look and there's my daughter, Gabriella. And she goes, it's me, Poppy. I told you I would always protect my brother and watch out for him. And I remember Dorn, like she literally had gold fleck in her skin. She was just glowing. And she looked at me with that radiant smile of hers and said, I'm happy, Poppy. I'm happy. Mm -hmm. And I woke up, it was like 4.30 in the morning. It was pitch black in the hotel room. My wife was laying in the bed next to me and my son was in the bed, you know, next to us. And I felt like I had a direct connection to heaven. Mm. And I, I truly felt like she could hear me and I could hear her. And I promised her, I said, you know what, honey, I have not been honoring you like I promised, but I promise from this day moving forward that I will honor you. And I, I have to share one other story. We were sitting in the principal's office at my son's school. He went to a Catholic school there in California and we were in the principal's office. We we're talking about my son, like, what's the best course of action for him? Do we homeschool him for the rest of the year? This was all around the same time that you and I had this conversation and I had this dream. And I heard this voice come from the corner of the room. And it said, it's time. And I looked up to the corner. I'm like, who said that? And it said, it's time. It's mm -hmm. time. And I was like, all right, it's time. So I just decided that I wasn't going to let this define me. It doesn't mean that, look, I, I'm getting emotional now. There's many days, especially now during the holidays that my wife and I cry. We miss our daughter every day. And it will be that way until I take my last breath on this earth. Yeah. But I will spend every day on this earth honoring her and showing others that bad shit can happen to you, right? Right? The worst that you can imagine that you may not know you have the strength, but I promise you, you do. You know, I coach kids hockey. I coach 15 and 16 year old young men. And I always tell them you are born with greatness inside of you, but it's nobody else's responsibility, but your own to go and find it. Amen. You got to go after the greatness. It's there. And you know, I always tell everybody that my daughter's passing obviously was the worst thing that's ever happened to me, but it's also been a blessing because in her passing, she has taught me so much. And, you know, it's my message to everybody is, look, there's going to be things that happen in your life. It could be COVID, right? COVID sucks. We all hate it. It's been a huge disruption for all of us. Some people will lose everything because of it. But I promise you, it doesn't have to define you for the rest of your life. It just is how bad do you want to get back in the game? How bad do you, you know, what are you going to do to help? That's what makes 
the United States, where I live, in my opinion, one of the greatest countries that there's ever been because my grandparents, my mom's parents immigrated here from Italy with nothing, zero, mm -hmm. and built an amazing life, right? And that's what is so great. But anyway, I don't want to get too far off. I just, you know, so Doran, you sparked me, you know, because you were like, and it wasn't rah, rah. It was just like, look, man, you're, you're built for more than this. And your daughter would want you to pick yourself up and move forward. Yeah. And yeah, I remember that conversation and I yeah. remember, I remember the, uh, the moisture on my cheeks. There was, there was some real raw honesty and real raw, um, vulnerability in that moment. But there's a turning point that happened when you were coaching your young boys. Hockey. Oh yeah. Tell us about that story because I feel like that's also part of your turning point story. I know the story you're talking about it. So it's the same, it's the Utah tournament. Yeah. It's the same weekend that I had the dream with my daughter. It's going into the same weekend that you actually, so I was in your accelerator program and you had talked to me about joining the seven figure program. And I was like, and you're like, look, dude, if you want to, if you really want to like pick yourself up and get back in the game, just do it. Right. And I did. And so for those of you watching or listening, understand that, you know, I, I read a lot of books and I'm into all of, you know, the, the, how to make yourself the best version of yourself. Right. So I'm telling all these young men to do it, but I'm not doing it myself. And I had an epiphany and I walked into the room and I said, look, you know, so it was my two assistant coaches and all my players. And I said, look, your coach is a hypocrite. And they kind of looked at me and I said, they probably don't even know what that word means, right? <laughs> but I said, I'm a hypocrite because I'm telling you guys to do all these things and I'm not doing them myself. And mm -hmm. I tell you that that stops now. That stops Ooh. now. Goosebumps. And my assistant coaches were like, whoa. But I wanted to show these young men like, look, just because I'm your coach, I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm just like you. Yeah. And if I'm going to hold you to a level of excellence, I'm holding myself to that same level. And, you know, I took, I always tell everybody, I mean, no disrespect to those players because I love them all dearly. Um, we weren't the best team in our division. We we're probably the least talented. I had a lot of players that came from in-house or rec league hockey who were in their first year of travel and learning all new things. And we went on and, you know, we went on to state championships and finished in third place. Amazing. Yeah. You know, um, so that was a big moment, but you know, it's, I'll tell you the other thing that really changed my life. And I learned it from you is, and, and I want to share this with everybody listening because I remember the conversation and, and you were like, so tell me what your morning routine is like. And I laughed. I was like, I, I don't know, hit the snooze button until I have to drag my butt out of bed. Grab the spatula, like, start to scrape. Yeah. And, I, yeah, I, and you're like, yeah, dude, that, that, that ends now. <laughs> And, and you're like, all right, so we won't, we won't go crazy. Like right now we'll get you up at six 30, right. And spend X amount of time in reflection and journaling and, and meditation. And then you're like, do you work out? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, okay, well, that's good. What are you listening to when you work out? I was like, well, I watch Netflix or I listen to music and you're like, yeah, no, that ends today. <laughs> and you know, you're like, look, you got to, while you're building your body, you're going to build your mind. And for me, that was really, truly the epiphany of all of it, because once I started working out in the gym and listening to either books on Audible or podcasts on guys that have achieved great success and they share, you know, how they do it and it just everything like it was like, and, you know, I, I listened to this book called Mindset which changed my life because, you know, I'm 50 years old, right? My daughter passed away when I was 47 going into my 48th year. And I just thought, well, you know, I'm, this is who I am for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And then I read that book mindset and realized that now you can change, you can rewire your brain. You can change yourself no matter what stage you are in your life. And I was like, wow, like that literally blew the top of my head off because I truly thought that, you know, like, I'm stuck this way forever. And, you know, I mean, it's, 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 I'm going to regress for a minute. It's heartbreaking because I do belong to some of these groups where people who lose their children and some people are so, I, they're where I was, you know, and my mission is to try and help them not 
not ever change them or, or fix their pain because you can't. Yeah. My mom told me a story that, you know, they, they live in Southern California and like the Palm Springs area and they're big golfers. And she said they met a couple who were in their seventies and they were just talking and they shared that they had lost a child. And she said, the woman started crying. And it had been 30 or 40 years since they lost their child. And I said, mom, that pain never goes away. No. A piece of your heart is literally cut out. Yeah. And you carry that pain until the day that you're rejoined in heaven. And, um, you know, so I like being that voice for these other parents who are going through this and say like, look, I know you're in the deepest of darkest places, yeah. but I promise you, you can take this pain and turn it into power and in a way that you honor your child, not forget them. Cause that's our fear, right? All of us that have lost children, our fear is that we move on without them. We forget them, that the world forgets them. Yeah. Right. That's the hard part. And, you know, it's, it's, um, God is amazing because it, as many flaws as we have as human beings, he has built an incredible creature. I mean, we are, we are pretty incredible as human beings and we have a hell of a lot more strength through him than we ever believe. And I wouldn't be here today. You know, I never used to talk about my faith in public ever, nor did I ever share my feelings. You know, for me to share my grief story on Facebook for me was a big thing because I was the guy that always was like, well, everything always has to look perfect, yeah. right? It always has to be perfect. Always, always, always. And then I decided, you know what? I want the world to see my journey, which is why I created my journey to hope, right? Yeah. I created that solo cast called My Journey to Hope, which was basically my journey from grief to hope. And I wanted the world, as many people who could, listen to what I did. And I, I think I shared with you, I remember when I said to my wife, I'm calling it My Journey to Hope. And at the time, she was still in a dark place. And she said, you know, there's no hope. There's no hope after losing a child. And I said, there is, and I'm going to show the world that there is. And you know, this is beautiful. Sorry, my, my phone. That's, that's my baby girl, Gabriella right there. I know there's a glare, but that's my beautiful daughter. Yeah. And she's, she's so wholesomely beautiful. She's, she is. And, and, you know, again, I don't think I thank you enough because I wouldn't be in this place I am today without, without your love. I mean, that's really what it is. And I know that, that it was, it was put on you from the big man upstairs. Like that's who you are as a man. And it's again, like I said earlier, I created an episode, be the spark because you were the spark for me, right? Like I had all but given up. I really was hopeless. And you showed me that I could get up, that I could fight, that I could rebuild my life and not forget my daughter, yeah. you know, and you showed me that I had it in me and you, you taught me some good skills along the way too, including those dang cold showers. <laughs> the more we shrink, the more we soar. <laughs> <laughs> I even got t-shirts for our seven figure lender Academy clients with that on the front. It says, I love cold showers. And on the back, it says, the more I shrink, the more I soar. <laughs> but it's been, it's just, uh, yeah, you know, it's yeah. been a delight and uh, a real blessing to be on the journey with you, brother. And uh, I truly feel, I don't just call you brother. I feel it to my core. You know, there's, a divine, there's a divine connection every time I hear your voice on a telephone call, or in this case, uh, I get the visuals as well. Uh, I just get connected to, uh, the fact that it's like the, you know, the Jonathan and David connection in the Old Testament. There's this brotherhood love that uh, I really feel is from above. So I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful to be part of uh, just being a spark, you know, a divine spark being used by the divine to spark you into your warrior self, your champion self, your winner self, and to step into being all that you're called to be as leader in your home leader in your community and now leader in the world through your podcast and all you're doing, not only uh, with your philanthropy and your, um, uh, your foundation that you're using to educate the uh, physicians around the U S of a, but also, you know, your podcast listening to this, I just saw a comment come through leader. You know, that's who you are. You are a leader. And there was a, 
season where I think you were so shrouded in grief and for good reason, you'd lost sight of the higher calling that God had for you in this unconscionable darkness that you were in. And so there is a purpose for grief and you went through that purpose. There was a ripening of your soul for a higher purpose that took some time to gestate. Tell us about, for someone who's going through grief, going through significant trials in their life right now, they're listening to this, they're feeling hope rise up in their souls because they're hearing your story and they're knowing this is someone who's gone through the fire. And it's not just, you know, talking from a whiteboard in theory. This is someone who's gone through the muck and mire of the fire on the front lines of real life and real heartbreak. And so there's there's a, a catalyzing, galvanizing power in your authentic story. So first of all, first off, I want to thank you for being courageous to warrior up, man up in the face of your grieving being come due for a new season and you deciding to say, yes, I take the call. You, yes, I take the mantle. Yes, I am ready for this next call. It's not comfortable, it's not convenient, and it sure as heck ain't easy, but I'm ready to step into this next season of using my pain to propel me into my purpose. Tell our audience, for those who are in that place where they've been grieving, they've been going through trials, and they're ready, their their soul is ready for that next season to turn their pain into a positive purpose. What does that look like? Take them by the hand, walk them through some of the, the soul steps that you took that they can also take to be able to take that pain into their purpose, not just a purpose that has them feel like they're using positive thinking, because I think positive thinking is bullshit if you're not soul connected to it on a real visceral level, level where you just know deep down in your soul, this is what you're called to. And it's mm -hmm. you're fully aligned and fully congruent. And it's it's a cohesive, coherent call that calls you forth from the from the gut. That's not something that you get from listening to a bunch of positive thinking bullshit. This comes from really aligning with God's call in your life. Tell me about uh, what those steps might be for someone who's really going through it right now. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. I'll, I'll share with you one thing quickly. I was laughing because there's a guy that I listen to, his podcast, Impact Theory. And I came to it because the first thing that, so I was listening to his podcast before you and I had our talk, before I really decided to make a decision to move forward. And what drew me to his podcast was like in the advertisement for it, it said, motivation is bullshit. And I thought, yeah, it is like, because motivation, like you and I've talked about it. You can't be motivated by money because eventually it wears out. And it's interesting because when I first used to listen to his podcast and he would have people on who talked about their stories and things they've been through, I'd be like, so what? You haven't lost a child, Psh. right? Now my mindset's completely different. Your problem is your problem. And to you, that's the worst thing that could have ever happened, right? Yeah. Could be you lost your job, your business, you got divorced. Maybe you've overcome an eating disorder, like any of those things to you, that's the worst thing that you've been through. So who am I to judge, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, but I think the most important thing is, is that if you're going through a season of grief, if you're going through a season of doubt or pain, the first thing you have to do is make a decision. Not like a, well, I'm going to try. A, a real decision like, look, I know this is going to be the hardest thing that I ever have to do in my life, but I'm going to prove it to nobody else but myself that I can overcome this, that I can do this. Mm. I mean, because if you don't, I'm going to use my dad's give me permission to talk about his story. My dad was an alcoholic for many, many years. He went to rehab multiple times, right? And there's a famous rehab facility in Palm Springs called Betty Ford. And you go there and they have your family come and you talk about all this bullshit, excuse my language. And I didn't go. And my mom got angry. And I said, I'm not going because dad's not ready to quit. And I'm not going to put my heart, my soul, my time on the line when he's not committed to it. Yeah. And so he went to rehab, I think four times. And finally he quit. Do you know why Doran? Because he decided that he wanted to quit drinking for himself. He right. made a decision and we've talked about it. And I said, can I ask you a question? Yes, son. What? I said, 
So when it came to your drinking and you finally decided to quit, like what was it? And he goes, you know what? I tried to quit for you. I tried to quit for your mother. I tried to quit for your sister, your kids. I couldn't do it until I decided that it's what I wanted. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. Until I truly decided. And you know, we, he said, he goes, when Gabriella passed away, he goes, I wanted to drink so desperately. He said, but I knew that that would go against the commitment that I made to myself. Yeah. And that's what it boils down to. I know anybody who's listening is like, that's easy. Like why well, you make it seem so easy. No, it's not. It's the hardest freaking decision you make in your life. This, my buddy said to me recently, well, this wasn't recently, about a year ago. He said to me, he goes, you know, well, about like getting up off the mat and fighting and rebuilding my life. He's like, well, you know, you didn't have a choice. I said, bullshit. I had a choice. I could have easily quit and the world would forgive me for it. They'd give me a free pass. Yeah. They'd be like, oh, his daughter passed away. Like he used to be a successful great guy. You can't blame the guy, right? Like, and I, so I tell him all the time, bullshit. I had a, I, I had a choice. I chose the path of soaring. I chose the path of, yeah, the world kicked the crap out of me. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, not to get crazy, but like I had to look at my daughter after she passed away. I saw my daughter after she died. It's the worst thing that any parent could ever experience any human being. I don't wish it on my worst enemy. No. And there were days when I wanted to die. I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want anything. And then I said, you know what? This is not the end of me. This does not define me. I'm going to show myself the world, my family, my friends, that I can rise up from this and I can honor my daughter while I do it. And again, it starts with a decision. You have to make a decision like, okay, I'm 100% committed to this. Now, that doesn't mean that some days there are going to be setbacks, right? And I will tell everybody listening, watching, whoever goes back and watches this, the place to start is to create a morning routine. You have to create a morning routine. I'm getting goosebumps, brother, because it's that turning point moment where you just decide enough is enough. No more. I've had it. I'm done with this way of life. I'm done with this grief. I'm done with this pain. I'm done with the sorrow. I'm done. And when you get to the point where the pain is fully baked and your soul is fully baked in that pain and you're just not wanting to go one more day in it, that's the turning point. So when you call... The word decision, I think it's a very well used word because that word is the same word as root word as scissor, which means to cut off from any other option. And that's the same thing. Correct. Any the same thing your father went through. He got to the point after recidivism four to three times and his fourth go at it, he finally got to the end of his rope. He's just decided to the core of his being, enough is enough, no more, I've had it, I'm done with this. And no one's gonna put a gun to our head and fork it, force us to change. Correct. That's on us, that's on us. And it's at that point, I call it the fed up threshold, right? When you just, you're just so freaking done with it, you're not willing to go one more day like that. And you get to the point where you realize, you know what, it's on me. If I'm gonna have a life purpose and meaning, it's on me. If I'm gonna pull myself out of the ashes and rise up out of the ashes like the Phoenix rising and make something of my life and make something of my leadership and make something of my legacy, it's on me by God's grace. By God's grace, I will rise up. And you know that's, that's really what it is. It's like, it could be just as much as saying, I'm fed up with this. I don't have the answers. I don't have even, frankly, the know-how. I don't have the path. I don't have the blueprint. I don't have the GPS coordinates. All I have is I'm fed freaking up. I'm done with this. And by God's grace, show me the way. Just show me the way. Amen. And that is that is exactly where I was. That was 100% where I was in my life, where like I remember even on our conversation, I'm like, I'm just so fed up. I'm just so tired of being in this place. And unfortunately, some people don't rise up. But I agree. I know this in my my soul is that you can become anything you want. I don't care. Like I use, um, my God, I'm forgetting his name right now. He's actually the HUD secretary here in California. He's a surgeon or here in the United States, excuse me. He was born into poverty. 
right? They made a movie about him called Idle Hands. He became the youngest head of, I think it's John Hopkins University. He was born in the projects, single wow. mother. You know, he said him and his brother were getting into trouble. And then mom was like, hey, this is what you guys are going to do. And she taught them, you know, how to go after what you want, how to rise up, how to rise above it, how to dream, how to see things outside of your current vision. That has a lot to do with it. You need to create your vision. You need to open it up and see down the road and say, this is a life I want to create. Like I have an exercise I do with my hockey players and I say, okay, I go around the room and say, tell me where, where do you want to be in your end goal? Some kids say the NHL. Some kids say they want to play college hockey. Some kids want to play juniors, right? And I say, okay, that's your end goal. Let's circle it. Now let's create, let's go backwards. How do we get there? Let's break it down into chunks. Let's figure it out. And then guess what they realize? Nobody's going to do the work for them. No. We can we can show them the way. We can give them the plan. We can do it all. But they have to want it more than anybody else. I mean, look at, let's use sports as an example because I think sports are such a great life lesson and teacher in life. Professional sports, there is one one hundredth, one one thousandth, whatever that number is of people who actually make it in professional sports and have a lasting career. Why? because they are willing to do more than anybody else, right? Mm -hmm. When everybody else is lazy and watching TV or surfing the internet, they're shooting baskets, they're shooting pucks, they're throwing footballs, they're whatever it might be. And that's why I say greatness lies inside of every one of us. God put it there, but he's not giving us a free pass to it. He's yeah. like, hey, it's there, Michael. But you, if you want it, you're going to work for it. It's you're like, going to show me that you're worthy of it, that you deserve it. 100%. God feeds right? birds, but he's not going to throw worms in their nest, right? We got to go out there. We got to fight for them. We got to, you know, yeah. go out there and toil for them. And uh, so often people want the glory of success. They want the champion level result, but they're not willing to level up the routines. So they got chump level routines, but they got champion level ambitions. That's not going to jive. No. So, you really spoke to a component of that with the morning routine. Cause I think that's a, a huge part, part of what it looks like to have a champion level routine is have a champion level morning routine. Cause when yes. you win the morning, you win the day. Tell us a little bit more before we pivot and, uh, and wrap this up and give people an opportunity to learn more about how they can plug into your podcast and more of what you bring to the world. Uh, tell us a little bit more about some of the things you do in your morning routine. You've mentioned a couple of them. Uh, you, you do your learn and burn, as we like to call it, where you're in the gym or exercising and while your hands are busy, your mind is free. Hit two birds, one stone. Fill your mind with inspiration, motivation, education while you're doing your exercise. And then, of course, we got the uh, infamous cold showers to ignite for the day, to wash away all the fear, all the doubt, all the weakness, all the excusitis, all the stinking thinking and what is coming out of that coldness. Yes. What, what remains after that cold dousing is fire, is power, is resolve, is I am a ma the master of my life. I'm the master of my domain. So there's that spiritual, mental, emotional reality that comes from stepping in voluntarily to something that's comfortable or rather uncomfortable and then becoming comfortable being uncomfortable through the routine of it. It's a condition. If you can do, take a cold shower, you can do freaking anything as far as I'm concerned. Because if you can take a cold shower in the morning, it ain't no thing like a chicken wang to pick up the phone and reach out to a realtor or reach out to a client or plan your work and work your plan. Heck, if you can do that, you can do pretty much anything it takes to create a champion level life. Tell us a little bit, a little bit more about what you do in your mornings to really rise up and win. Yeah. And, and I think you nailed it though, real quick is that the difference that separates champions from, I'm not going to say chumps, but from non-champions is that we're willing to do what's uncomfortable. That's really the key. Right. And that's what I learned through the morning routine. So the morning routine for me is I work out first, right? So I get up, I have a routine. I either have a cup of coffee or some tea and then I go in the gym, right? Learn and burn, do the gym. I'm blessed because I have a gym in my house. Some nice. people aren't, so they got to go, you know, drive to the gym. But so I do the gym, then I meditate. Then I do a little journaling. 
right? And in my journaling, I always start out with gratitude, you know, what I'm grateful for. And and so my journaling starts the same way every day. And it's this, it's thank you, Lord, for blessing me with another day. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to make a difference and serve in your name and your honor. And, you know, then I kind of go through my prayers with him and my, my, you know, gratitude with God. And then I talk to my daughter and, and, you know, tell her that I'm hoping that I'm living up to what her expectations are for me honoring her. And that if she can please continue to lead and watch over her brother and sister and her mother. And, you know, um, and, and then I end with, um, I, I end with something that says, you know, it's your time is now go out and win the day. Right. And then I learned something from a guy named Andy Frisella, which is the five critical tasks. I write down the five critical things that I need to accomplish that day to win the day. One of them is my morning routine. Right. Hmm. And so I feel like, so Andy's feeling is if you can win four out of the five days of the week, you win the week. Hmm. If you start winning weeks, then you win months. If you start winning months, you win a year. And, and if you look back in a year, how your life will be transformed. Right. And it's not easy, especially in Colorado. It gets cold here, man. The cold showers are frigid. Oh, yeah, man. Talk about, you know, the cold white north here in Canada. It comes out in freaking chunks up here, bro. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's 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 easy to say when you're in California, but when you get out here to Colorado and the high for the day is 21 degrees Fahrenheit, it's that's cold, insane. you know. Yeah, that's but, called second belly button. That's yeah, saying something. yeah. <laughs> and, and, but I, I, yeah, I want to go back to, to what you were saying is, you know, the, the morning routine, really what it teaches you, especially the cold shower. So of course, in my studies, and you know, this is that cold showers actually have real physical benefits, like medically, scientifically proven medical benefits for your body. Yeah. Um, there's a guy named Wim Hof who's, who, I mean, the stuff he's done with cold therapy and cold work is absolutely off the charts. And if you guys haven't seen him, check him out. It's just crazy ridiculous. Um, but it the cold shower, the like you said, what's that? He's the cryo king. He is just crazy. I mean, I love the guy, but he's he's <laughs> off the chain. But anyway, it's the cold shower to me. Like if you can do that, it's so easy to pick up the phone and call a realtor or a client or whomever, or anything you need to handle during that day, it seems like nothing. And, and I tell everybody like the, you complete your morning routine and you check it off and you feel like you've just climbed Mount Everest. And you're like, it's eight, eight o'clock in the morning. And I've achieved all this. And most of the people have just gotten out of bed or just getting going. And look what I've done already in my day. I've already won no matter what happens from this point on. Right. To me, to anybody who's listening, if you're in a deep, dark place, if you're going through COVID and you've lost your job or if you've lost, look, you don't need a gym. You could go for a walk. You can do squats. You can do push-ups. There's many things that you can do, right? You can curl chairs. You can overhead <laughs> presses with chairs. Like no I've done it in hotel rooms. You can do it, All right. right? You can jog. You can do whatever it might be to qualify as exercise. Start journaling your hopes, your dreams, your fears. Start getting connected to the spirit, the universe. You know, I, I'm I'm a believer. I believe in God. You know, mm -hmm. um, Jesus is my savior, and and I share my faith with the world. Some people maybe don't have the same feelings as us, Doran. So I say, look, just get in touch with the universe, whatever you might believe in. Um, but that's really where it starts. You're going to be stuck until you do that. But it all, my, I, so, you know, I created a podcast that was a solo cast called my journey to hope. Yeah. And then I've created a new podcast called the daily decision, because as I was just about to say is, look, it starts with a decision. You have to make a decision and a commitment to yourself that you're not going to accept what you are going through right now. And that's what you did for me, Doran. You were like, dude, look, you have a choice. Yeah. You can lay down and give up. Or you can get up and fight and it's up to you. What do you, what do you choose? And, and I want everybody to understand your brain is created to protect you, right? So when it's cold in the morning and you don't want to get out of bed and you're comfortable under them covers, you know, the brain's like, oh, just stay in bed. It's cold, Michael. And this morning routine teaches you to go, yes, yeah, shut up. I'm getting up. <laughs> I'm going to make that hard call. I'm going to call that person I want to meet with, even though they might hang up on me. I don't care. I can do it. 
Because I took a cold shower, right? Or I, I've been going to the gym now for 90 days straight or whatever it might be, right? Bingo. It, it's a battle between this, this thing between your ears and this thing here, your heart, your soul, not the physical heart that beats in your chest. Though through my journey, I have learned that the heart controls the brain as much as the brain controls the heart. There have been scientific studies. There's something right. called heart math. I don't know if you've heard of heart math. Heart coherence. Um, I interviewed somebody on my podcast where she was teaching uh, fighter pilots to control their heart rate, to actually lower their heart rate and their breathing um, mm. so that they could perform better in combat. So, sorry, I know I'm, I'm, I'm talking and talking here, but I just get so pumped about this stuff because I think that as human beings, we accept our reality instead of create it. Yes, yes. Right? Being at the effect of circumstance yes. as opposed yes. to being at cause. Yeah. And I just want to highlight a few things before we pivot and give people an opportunity to connect with more of the goodness that you bring to the world. First off, I want to highlight the fact that you, number one, you got to the point where you're fed up and sick and tired of being sick and tired of being in the same old spot and you're ready to rise up. So that was one that's called hitting the fed up threshold. Number two, you made a powerful decision to choose faith, not fear. You made a powerful decision to take the pain of your circumstance and to attach a positive purpose to it that had you rise out of the muck and mire, out of the ashes, and to be animated by the divine, the unlimited, to fulfill your calling and your purpose on your life. So you said yes to your divine calling, even in the face of indescribable pain and grieving. And then on top of that, you took ownership and you got really vulnerable and real, vulnerable to the point where in front of your entire hockey team with you as the coach saying, I'm a hypocrite. I haven't been doing the stuff that I told you guys that you need to be doing yourself. And that starts, that stops today. So that's called living in the truth. Mm. Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Mm -hmm. My issue to that is it's probably going to piss you right off at first, though. That truth usually will piss you off. But then you get to the point where you just have to man up or woman up and just decide to align ourselves with the truth because the truth is the only way to claim freedom. And it's been a journey for you of choosing faith, not fear ever since to choose to live in your purpose, in love in peace, in power, in courage, instead of in fear and sticking your tail between your legs, admitting defeat and failure, and just slinking through life, feeling sorry for yourself. It's been a journey every single day of choosing love and courage over fear. And it's a moment to moment decision. So I just want to highlight a few of the things that um, I've seen in you in your journey that are worthy of illumination, because I think people need to see those anchor points to be able to see those those steps so they can follow in your, your footsteps. Cause you truly are a, li a leader living, living and leading by example. And that's the power of a leader in times of darkness in times of fear. Leaders are needed more than ever before, especially mm -hmm. a leader who's gone through hell and crawled out the other side because the depth of the darkness you've gone through is equal to the height of the light. You can shine in this dark world. So I just, uh, feel so blessed to be part of seeing you step into your identity as a leader, like never before you were a leader before now you're a leader animated by a divine calling that inspires people to goosebumps and tears because they feel what you've gone through and they connect it to the pain that they're going through or the pain they've gone through or the pain that they will go through. And there's a humanity connection, a heart connection, humanity to humanity that wasn't available before. So if there's anything I can highlight, there's, we could spend all day highlighting all the divine blessings that you've received through this journey, through this, this darkness you've gone through, through Gabriella shining her light in your life, through her passing. Uh, one of which being your influence as a leader, so it turns out we uh, lost connection because this podcast was so off the chain awesome. I lost sight of time and literally I've never done a podcast over an hour. So I was not aware of the fact that BeLive.TV, which is where we stream this live, 
has a one hour limit. So there you go. If you didn't know, now you know. <laughs> now, one of the things I want to do is pick up where we left off and just uh, highlight the fact that, um, yeah, it took a decision. It also took courage and it's been a day to day fight, a day to day choosing of love and courage versus fear and just giving up. And every single day, we too have that choice. Every single day, we have a moment to moment cho choice to choose love and courage versus fear and inadequacy, lack limitation and playing to our weak self. Every single moment of every single day, we have a choice to play to our weak self or our winner self, to play to fear or to play to faith, to play to what we are not enough of and inadequate and just sinking into contraction mode versus I may not be perfect. I may have failures that I would have done differently in my past, but I am made by greatness for greatness and I don't have to be perfect. I seek progress, not perfection. And again, notice the expansion energy in that versus contraction. So I just highlight that because I'm seeing that in your journey and you're leaving footsteps for people to follow in your journey. And you are hands down 10 times the leader you used to be before. You were a powerful leader before. Now you're a leader of people's souls. You are a leader who brings goosebumps, not because you're trying to, but because you're being real and you're sharing your store, story with vulnerability, authenticity. And you're sharing the depth of your soul and your pain with people. And you're also on the flip side, showing your courage and the power to choose life in the face of that darkness. So I just want to acknowledge that in you. And uh, man, it's been amazing watching you blossom and bloom into the powerful man of God and leader that you are today. And I know God ain't done with you yet. He's just getting warmed up, baby. You haven't even scratched the surface of the surface of what God's going to do in you and through you through this. So feel blessed to be part of the journey with you, brother. Yeah, that that gave me chills. Thank you. Um, I just want to add a couple of things just to kind of wrap a bow on that. And I want people to understand that I still have moments, right? I'm not, you might think by hearing my story and seeing what happens, like, oh, wow, like Michael's some perfect thing. And, and that's not even close. Like I still have bad days. I still have days where I cry and I miss my daughter and I feel bad for myself, but I've got to, I've, I've learned how to then say, okay, it's cool. Like I'm going to feel it and I'm going to let it come on like a tidal wave and I'm going to go through the emotion. And now I can get up and keep moving forward and keep pushing towards where I want to get to. Right. And yeah. the other thing I want to talk about is, you know, it's interesting, Doran, is I don't consider myself a leader. And I know that probably might shock you, but I, my whole thing is that I want to show people through my journey and through my pain that anything is possible. And maybe that's leadership. But I want my life to be a legacy that says, look, you're going to go through some bad shit in life, but you can get through it. You can overcome it. You can push through the pain. I always say, everybody, you got to walk through the fire to get into the light or through the darkness to get into the light. And I know it, it sounds good in theory, but you got to do it. Like so many people fail because they try and walk around the darkness and go the easy way to the light. And it's like, if you want greatness, you got to go through the darkness. You got to go through the shit to get to the good. And, you know, again, my legacy, the thing that I, my son gets upset sometimes because I will share my story with people. Like, I think sometimes he would rather people not know, right? It's easier for him. He's a young man. He's only 15 years old. And I don't tell people, and this is what I tell my son. I don't tell people because I want them to feel sorry for me or pity for me. I want them to hear my story. So they say, wow, he inspired me. Mm -hmm. Wow. That guy lost his daughter. Look at what he's been through and look at who he is as a human being. Look at how he treats people. Look at what his story is. If I can help change one life, if I can inspire one person to tap into their greatness, that's it for me, brother. I mean, that makes me emotional. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I know you yeah. live the same passion. That's who you are as a man too. And when you can find that in life, it changes everything. Yeah. And that's leadership. It's influence. Leadership is influence and influence is leadership. And so you're really speaking to the heartbeat of a leader that is inspired by God to 
fulfill a divine purpose. And that is to influence for good, to influence for love, to influence for courage, to influence to pierce through the darkness and to shine the light of love and laughter. And, you know, the purpose that is the divine is always a purpose that propels into love and courage and expansion towards elevating humanity to become more like the divine, more mm. like Jesus was a perfect emulation, a perfect embodiment of divine because he was divine. We fall short on a multitude of fronts, but there's an example he gave us, which is influencing people to not be perfect, but to press on towards love, to embody that spirit of love. And you've certainly uh, been that for me. And I know for many others, how can people get plugged into your podcast, plugged into, you know, what you're bringing out into the world uh, through these various messages that you're, you're publishing? Yeah. So, I mean, I have my solo cast, which I've actually put on hold for a while, which was my original podcast, my journey to hope. Um, it's on Apple, it's on Spotify, it's on, you know, all those things. I have a website, but that's called my journey, the number two hope. Mm. And then my current podcast is called the daily decision. And the goal, you were a guest on that show. The goal is to have people on that show who have overcome things, achieved great success in life, because I believe that this is the one thing we didn't touch on, but mentorship is so important. You need a good mentor in your life to help you to bounce ideas off of, to pick you up when you're having a day where you're not maybe hitting all your marks. And that's what my daily decision podcast is about is that yes, every day you make decisions that either take you closer to your goals or further away. But just because you have a bad day or a couple of days, it's okay as long as you continue to push forward. That's the key, momentum, momentum, push, mm. push. You know, when we were kids, remember that train that had to go up the hill? The little train that had to get up the hill, right? I think I can. Right? I can, I think. Right? I mean, there's truth to that, you know? And I think it might have been, it was either Ford. Was it Ford who said, if you think you can, you will. If you think you can't, you won't. Yeah, whether you believe you can or you can't, you're right. Right. And there's another guy, and I'm going to mess this up. It's a great book about, and he said his dad was a guy who dealt with all these things. And it was, is, is, is if you, if you're hopeless, you're helpless. Right. But if you're yeah. hopeful and I can't remember what the other part is, I'll, I'll send it to you so you can it, tell people, but it reminds me of a great quote though, if I can uh, bridge the gap for you. And it's when there's hope for the future, there's power in the present. Yes. Yes. Right? And, and that's, that's the power. key is you have to remain hopeful. And what, what burns my fire is that, Forget about what I do for a living and how I feed my family, but my goal in life is to show people that, and I started out by saying this at the very beginning, is that human beings are resilient and you can go through some of the worst things ever. And if you've got the gumption and the stomach and the fight within you and your heart and you let God lead you, you can, you can rise above it. You can walk out of the fire. You can come out and soar. And I know it. There's, there's millions of stories of people who were born with nothing, into poverty, with illness, with, I mean, there's a guy who lives in my old neighborhood in California, no arms, no legs. This is how he was born. He's the most motivational speaker ever I've ever met. The guy, you want to talk about hope? I mean, he was born with no arms and no legs, literally. And he's the most happy, hopeful, positive guy you ever met. And I think I'm going to leave you with this and then I'm going to shut the hell up is that... <laughs> <laughs> live in gratitude because yes. we live in a time where we have more now than we've ever had. Yeah. And by the way, you can learn whatever you want. It's on YouTube. It's on rumble, these different sites. You can learn anything you want to learn. You want to start a business. You've always dreamed of having a dress shop. You can go to Google and YouTube and figure out how to do it. Right. And so my, my thing to leave with you guys is gratitude. Do gratitude journaling every day. Wake up and be grateful, even if it's just because you have a roof over your freaking head. Be grateful that you have three meals a day, right? That your family is healthy, that you have a life, that you have a God who is there, who leads you and guides you. Be grateful. 
and know that there's possibility in this day and age, you can become whatever you want. Shoot for the stars, man. Go for it. That's it. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you for being courageous. Thank you for choosing life, not death. Thank you for choosing to be that warrior of light for your family, uh, for those young boys who look up to you as their leader in, in the hockey uh, change room and on the hockey rink. Thank you for uh, being courageous and, and leading by example uh, as a sales manager for your LOs, because that's another dimension of your influence. Thank you for having the courage to take uh, this calling and take the pain that has propelled you into this calling and to say every single day, here I am, Lord, use me. And to say to your daughter, sweetheart, I'm still needing strength. I'm needing guidance. I'm needing encouragement and feeling, fueling that fire of your purpose and your daughter every single day. That's a choice. And you've been courageous and you've really stepped into this, not knowing necessarily how it's going to unfold, but knowing every day is a choice of faith to just say, here I am today. I will press on today. I will do my part today. So I salute you for your courage. I salute you for your heart to serve. I salute you as a brother from another mother and a fellow warrior and uh, man of God for being true to your faith, even though you like me are a fallen man and we have much that is still needing to be perfected on the other side of heaven. Your heart is to serve, to love and to make a difference. And so I just honor you for who you are and your heart to serve and for your courage to rise up every day to do your part in that. So I just love you, Thanks, brother. Man. I appreciate you so much. And, uh, Feel blessed to be uh, a brother on the journey with you and uh, to count you a true friend. Well, I, I appreciate it. And I, okay, I lied. I want to leave you with one last thing. There's a guy I listened to, Ed Milet, and he's a very strong man in his faith. And this is what he believes. In heaven, there's a perfect version of himself. And his mission on earth is to try and live as close as possible to that version so that when he gets there, he says, you know what? You did a pretty good job. He knows he won't get there because he's imperfect as a man but it's his job to try and live that life. And that's, I just want to thank you because if it wasn't for you and your love and your calling to help me, I wouldn't be the man I am today. I wouldn't be sitting here. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, man. Oh, it's uh, truly a blessing brother. And now you get to pay it forward and be that for many, many, many more. And you're already being that for your, uh, your family and you're already being that for your boys that you coach and uh, people who are listening to your podcast. So that's the cool part of it is now you get to be that for other people and uh, you get to see them come alive and rise yes. out of the ashes. So Amen, brother. We're on, we're on the same team and uh, we are warriors of light doing the Lord's work. And I think that's uh, one of the reasons why we have such a deep heart connection to purpose in, uh, in our relationship because it's beyond just the starting place that launched our relationship, which is the mortgage business. This is so beyond the mortgage business. This is about God's business and it's about the business of love, the business of becoming the best version of ourselves in love and uh, shining the author of love, the author of life, shining that light in us and through us. That's really what this thing called life is all about. So Amen. appreciate you, brother. Thank you so much on behalf of uh, our audience, people listening, watching. I know they got inspired. If they're anything like me, they got a little leaky and uh, had a few uh, tears and probably a few goosebumps. Thank you from my heart to yours, brother, for who you are. And uh, thank you for all that you do. Appreciate Thanks, you. Thanks, brother. Talk soon. All right. Be blessed, man. All right. Bye. Cheers.